There are people out there who have what was conservative. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the July 20th regular scheduled meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board. First item on the agenda is the, agenda is the minutes of the previous meeting of June 15th, 1999. Any discussion from the board members before they're approved? I move that the minutes be uh, approved as written. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Emery. Mr. Parkhurst, there's no further discussion. All those in favor, raise your right hand, please. It is unanimous. In our correspondence this week, we had a letter from M. Townsend and J. Donnelly in regards to the Scout House, a letter from J. and S. On behalf of John Chance, hearing no discussion, we'll move on to old business, St. Albans Church Edition Site Plan. The applicant, come forward, please. site plan standards to this project and have suggested some potential conditions of approval. Is that a dinosaur attacking town hall that I hear? I don't know what the noise is. Oh. <laughs> Vacuum cleaner. Oh. <laughs> that must be one heck of a who. <laughs> State of the art technology. When the applicant is ready, you could just introduce yourself and begin with any new information you may have you. for us. I'm Nancy Barbe from Barbe Architecture and Preservation, and I'm here representing St. Albans Episcopal Church. And with me tonight is Don Bonoff, who is with the building committee, and Anthony Munch, who is the landscape architect. Um, the new information we have would be the one, the, the information that was asked for at the last meeting, we've responded to Stephen Harding, the town engineer's request for additional information in the package you should have received in the mail. In addition, we have um, a, what we believe is a de minimis change to the lighting to re reduce the amount of lighting that we had previously submitted and like to um, distribute that to you now. We're proposing to use less foot candles on the on the parking lot, and, which we um, for for cost saving reasons, and feel that what we're showing is probably sufficient to cover with with even a better impact on the neighborhood, or less of an in impact, I should say. I'd be glad to answer any questions. I don't know if you want me to run through the whole list of information. Oh, actually, we do have a couple of drawings that you haven't seen before. They're actually drawings that predated our, our presentation, but give you a sense of what the building might look like from both from Shore, Shore Road. Um, these are done by Christopher Glass, the, our, the architect that we have inherited the job from. Um, pretty much will look like this, with the exception of that dormer. There will be no Dormer on that piece that's looking from Shore Road showing the tower and the church beyond with a new addition on the side and then again from up in the parking lot showing the existing church this lower connector and the new parish hall with a new entrance.
be glad to answer any questions. Before I open the matter up for discussion between the board and the applicant, I'd like to open the public hearing, which time at the end of which you can respond to any comments that come up. At this time, I'd like to open the public hearing. Anybody that has an interest in speaking on this project, feel free to come forward and introduce yourself by first name. <coughs> the usual mad rush to the podium. Is there anyone present who would like to speak? Seeing no one, the public hearing is now closed. The applicant could return to the podium. And board members, as you wish, do you have any questions? Mark, go right ahead, please. Ask a question. Uh, could you uh, walk us through what the exterior materials are that you're planning on, planning <laughs> okay. on using? Okay. Um, and how they relate to uh, the existing building? And any plans for okay. the existing building itself? The existing building will stay the same as it is at this stage. Um, the existing building is a red cedar shake wall of random pattern. Um, a slate roof, and that's pretty much the predominant material other than the stained glass. The proposed addition is a shingle siding. We're not, um, we're not totally settled on whether it's going to be a white cedar with a, with a clean line versus the random edge or a red cedar with that same, but it'll be a, a cedar material. And then the roof is proposed to be an architectural shingle that resembles slate. And the glass uh, will be clear and a muntined window. And a little less fuzzy than the drawing shows. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Nancy, you? Um, apparently, the, the, apparently the town engineer um, recommended that an additional detail be added to the plans uh, of stormwater management. Has that been done? You're referring to which, which question, on it, which D. comment did he? D. D. Comment D. Hmm. Not sure if I know the answer. Give us a minute. We'll look that up. Are there other questions? Maureen, could you help? Um, my understanding is that there's just one fixture that you refer to, and it's on the uh, the upper left corner of the addition, <coughs> and you just refer to it as, I believe, D1, and the town engineer had wanted an actual detail because that type of designation apparently is used by different people for different types of fixtures. So it's really just an additional detail of what that structure is going to be like. D1. Okay. Right. I don't know offhand. We'd have to look. I guess the other question would be if, if you haven't done it, are you willing to do it? Excuse me. My name is <coughs> Tony Minch, landscape architect. Is this one of the details that was requested? Was the swale detail? Is it the stone riprap as it comes off the upper parking area? Um, there is a small drain in at a DI, which is a, a small circular notation on the site plan on the upper corner of the building. That's the one. Right. And that, that would be a drain inlet. And what we were talking about doing, and I talked with Tom Greer, was to put a solid ADS or, or PVC pipe that goes parallel to the foundation drain and then routes down to the bottom of the site and hooks into the proposed catch basin down here in with the foundation drains, be in the same trench but a separate pipe without any perforation. And it's to pick up some of this upper walk runoff as it comes down to the corner of the building because of the kind of precarious drainage scenario we have. But there isn't a specific detail of how that works, whether it be corrugated metal pipe or with a small great excuse me i'm steve harding i'm the town engineer i made the comment um basically <laughs> what he's describing is that 
is similar to uh, uh, many fixtures that, that have been put in. Oh, my, my just my comment was just to explain what you're going to put in so that there's no confusion when we get to construction of what you intended to do. And I think Tom Greer can come up with that detail fairly easily. Thank you. Yes. Tom. Uh, just a couple of comments. There's no uh, screening of the parking area along Shore Road indicated on the plan. There's a lot of plant materials, so I'm, it would seem to me to be appropriate to try to screen that somehow. And I'm not suggesting that you need to buy more plant material, but just simply relocate some if you have some extra to relocate. Uh, and the other comment is, is the, drain, the drainage on the south side of that parking area seems to be quite channelized. It's coming all the way along the south side of the building in a channel. And then it gets, and that uh, swale or channel just ends at the, the parking area. And I can't tell where the water goes from there. It looks like it just bleeds right out onto uh, Shore Road at that point. Is that correct? Is this the lower parking lot you're referring yes. to? Yes. Mm -hmm. Right, it does. It goes the same direction as the existing driveway as it comes down. It does go out onto Shore Road. And where does it go from there? Does it sheet flow to a, a, a drain inlet, a storm drain? The way the, um, there's a catch basin right across the street that's connected on the, what would be the eastern side of Shore Road going along, going along the road on that edge. Uh, to me, it seems highly unusual to, to allow for, if this were just sheet flow and coming down across a lawn or something, I wouldn't question it, but it's channelized uh, both in the upper portion of the site as well as close to Shore Road. And, and I'm just wondering if there's a need to dissipate it before it. Uh, I, don't, I don't think you want that to, to flow directly across Shore Road to the other side unless there's... Um, we could bend these contours and push the runoff off the paving over into the area to the south of this entrance. Is, that's nothing There's that no. the, I don't mean to put the town engineer on the spot. Um, is that an unreasonable concern? Basically, when we looked at it, the, the existing the existing drive goes all the way up through here, mm -hmm. and currently the, the water does come down the driveway. It just sheet it floats sheet down the floats. driveway and across. Okay. They've significantly shortened this, and they're also encouraging some runoff flow to go over here behind a rock wall okay. where there's an existing low area. And again, they've removed this building so there's less impervious area in that portion of the site. So in theory, if it isn't a problem now, it probably shouldn't be a problem in the future. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Chair, may I answer? Certainly. Go right ahead, question? please. Um, you asked about screening this parking lot, and we, we had initially started off of that in the workshop stage. And as I explained, I believe at the last meeting, we eliminated the screening um, for safety reasons, because we were afraid that if someone was trying to come out of there, a screening might um, might obscure the view of traffic coming from one direction, or might obscure the traffic's view of someone trying to come out. Thank you. I think the issue is just to hold the screening back so that it doesn't interrupt with sight distances, but there's, there's several spaces there that clearly could be screened. I'm not, and again, I'm not suggesting you buy more material. There's, there's a lot on the plan and just okay. change of species or whatever you need to do. But I don't know if the board's aware of it, but I just happened to catch that this uh, play area is surrounded by a chain link fence. I don't know if um, was there any discussion about using a wood fence or something that's more appropriate to, uh, I hate to say more appropriate to Shore Road. I mean, that, as soon as I say that, there's probably 10 dog runs on Shore Road that yeah. I'm not familiar with. But It's actually a wire fence that's woven into the hedge. So that most of it is, is concealed by hedge. On the uphill side, there'd be some of the 
it's described as a four-foot vinyl-coated mesh fence. Right. Is that not chain link? No. A sample of um, Oh, okay. Yeah, that's good. Uh, in going through the uh, packet, we have, unless I'm missing something, I have three drawings, is that correct, but no architectural drawings in this packet? Correct. <clears throat> so the board doesn't have in front of it evidence of the height of the building or that other than in the, um, as may be described in the materials, but there's no uh, general dimensions of windows and, and height and those sorts of things. You have uh, 11 by 17 drawings of the building at eighth inch scale. It should have been in the original package, not in the additional request. Oh, well, there's the problem. <laughs> I don't have that in front of me this evening. There, there are no dimensions on the vertical information, though, but it's, it's lower than the existing building, if that matters, and it's less than the height limitation. Uh, the reason I ask is that we went through this in the town center, and admittedly this is different than the town center in terms of the town center has stricter guidelines, but uh, when the plan goes from the, an approved site plan goes from the planning board to the code enforcement officer, it's good to at least have some general description geometric description so that the code enforcement officer, um, well, I guess we have floor-to-floor -floor heights given in this elevation. Uh, we don't have roof slopes. I believe that may be a condition of approval in our packet anyway, Maureen, for additional. The, the only con condition I proposed is that they identify what the exterior materials would be. I didn't say <coughs> about more detailed architectural drawings. Well, let me ask an, a uh, just just a question. What if what if the applicant were to come back with a uh, two and a half story building with a flat roof to mimic the uh, bell tower? I'm not I'm not trying to uh, create trouble here, but I'm just asking a, a question in the event that something like that might happen, that you might run into budget purposes. The roof slopes might need to get flat. Budget issues. The roof slopes may may need to get uh, shallower, and, and an upper window may disappear. Um, I think at least the sense I have as one planning board member, we're sort of approving the massing of the building as we see it. And I guess conversely, if the building were to be jacked up another six feet, um, we don't have evidence in front of us this evening that controls that. Let me restate it. As far as I can see, we don't have, a, we don't have evidence in front of us that controls that. So um, I would just, when we get around to the issue of, I would add to the to that other condition, the issue that uh, the roof slopes be indicated on these, added to these plans along with a description of the materials. Further comments from the board? Yes, David. I have a question that may have been brought up before, but do you have a detail showing the light fixture so we can see uh, what the cutoff may be? It should, it should be in the, on the drawing. C3, I don't know if that's enough detail that you're looking for. It doesn't show the cutoff, but the calculations are based on that fixture, so it would show you how much, <coughs> how many foot candles would be evident at what distance. My question is more of in regards to what, whether the cutoff will shield it from the neighbors across the street. If you had a detail on it, I'd be curious to see it. We don't have a detail here tonight. Y y you can see that. I see that. The yeah, point oh six. by the time it gets to the. It looks good there. I was just curious what the fixture looked like. Okay. If that was, could be shown. I think it would be important. <laughs> Further comments from board members? 
Mr. Emery again. Uh, the mounting height of the fixture, I may be missing something. Is that indicated? Okay. And the smaller one is eight feet. We we had uh, the discussions regarding on street parking and all of those were at our last meeting, which was in this chamber, was it not, or was it still in workshop? I believe it was in this chamber, in addition to the workshop. Right. So the public had plenty of. Uh, information in order to raise interest if they were were going to come and comment on that issue. Yes, I agree. Good. Thank you. I think the plan looks nice. I think it's going to be a very nice project. Any questions from the applicant? Is a motion in order? Mr. Emery. Uh, motion for the board to consider finding of facts. St. Albans Church is requesting site plan review of the proposed addition to the existing church to serve as a new parish house located at 885 Shore Road. Two, the town engineer recommends that more specific information be provided regarding the design of the drainage structure. Three, the applicant has provided a lighting plan which does not show light levels off the property and lighting de details which do not include light shields. Four, the site includes several mature trees and landscaping which the applicant has included in the site plan. Five, the building elevations do not include information regarding exterior materials or roof slopes. I may add that. Uh, six, the plan substantially complies with the requirements of sec section 19-9 site plan review. Therefore, be it ordered that, based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of St. Albans Church for site plan review of a proposed addition for the new parish house located at 885 Shore Road be approved subject to the following conditions. One, that the drainage inlet detail information requested by the town engineer in his letter dated July 8, 1999 be provided. Two, that the applicant confirm that light shields will be used or that illumination from the proposed lighting will not exceed 0.5 foot candles at the lot line. Uh, three, that a vegetation preservation plan be submitted for review and approval by the town planner. Four, that the information regarding exterior materials and roof slopes be added to the building elevations. Uh, if the siding materials are man-made, such as but not limited to concrete block, sheet metal, vinyl, aluminum, and not wood shingles or clapboards, copper or brick, then the revised exterior elevation shall be submitted to the planning board for review. And five, that there be no alteration of the site nor issuance of a building permit until the plans have been revised in accordance with the above conditions and submitted to the town planner for review and approval. Second. Thank you, Nancy. A motion has been made and seconded. Is there further discussion from the board? Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. It is unanimous. Thank you very much to the applicant. Thank you. Please stay in touch with our town planner. We will. <laughs> just for a moment while we change all our visual aids. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Assuming that the uh, next project on the agenda will be the next one heard, I will go ahead and recuse myself at this time. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the Public Works Facility Site Plan request by the Town of Cape Elizabeth for Site Plan Review, a resource protection permit, and a conditional use review of the new Public Works Facility and Playing Fields to be located at 478 Spurwink Avenue. 
Section 19-9, Site Plan Completeness, and Section 19-8-3, Resource Protection Permit Completeness. While we're getting set up, Maureen, you want to introduce the project? Uh, I, I wanted to point out something to the board. It's left off the agenda, but it is in your memo that um, the town council approved technical amendments to the zoning ordinance on July 12th, and one of those amendments uh, was an effort to streamline the development and review process. In that effort, it was determined that if a project required conditional use review and it had to go to the planning board for site plan review, that Normally, what would happen is a project would go to the zoning board for their conditional use review, then proceed to the planning board for site plan review. Under this new amendment, the planning board does the conditional use review. And I just wanted to call your attention to that because this is the first project that you will be required to apply the conditional use standards to, as well as site plan review and the resource protection <coughs> permit standards. I also wanted to inform the board that first we must determine whether this application is complete and no substantial uh, discussion concerning the application can be done until that is concluded. Thanks for your patience. Sorry that it took so long to set that up. Um, my name is Steve Harding. I'm the town engineer. I work for Host Associates. Uh, just like to start out um, asking the board what kind of a presentation you'd like to see. Uh, I know we've been through this a few times. Would you like to see a more detailed presentation or would you like more of a general overview of the project? <coughs> for the benefit of the public here tonight and watching at home, go right ahead in detail. Okay. All right. This, this parcel uh, was purchased in 1998 by the town of Cape, Cape Elizabeth. Um, basically, we've been working with, Host Associates has been working with the building, uh, excuse me, the Facility 2000s Building Committee uh, on several municipal buildings in town, this being the first step of that, that committee's uh, uh, task. Basically, what we have on the left-hand side is a total overview of the parcel. Let me get you oriented. Uh, the town transfer station is located up here. Uh, we have Spurwink Avenue located along the top side here, which falls back uh, in this direction. Uh, we have Fowler Road down here on the, the bottom of the, the sheet, and there's several res residences uh, right along Fowler Road here. Uh, the town high school on this, this sheet would be over in this area here. There's a large wetland area that's, that's located just off the sheet. Uh, the sheet to the, to the right is a more uh, detailed blow-up of this area which will be developed uh, by this plan. Uh, the total overall acreage of this site is about 113 acres. Uh, there's a small three-acre parcel located up here which the town had already previously purchased. Uh, the intent of the purchase was to serve basically four, four, uh, four goals. One was to take this large wetland area and, pres and preserve that for uh, public use. That wetland area connects to larger wetland areas off-site and also uh, provides a direct uh, connection to this area back to the town center area. Uh, the second goal was to provide a place for the new public works facility to be built. A third goal was to, was to prepare uh, an area for recreational field development. And a fourth goal was to provide the, the transfer station with a buffer so that uh, some other uh, private entity might come in here and, and request more of a buffer from the, from the transfer station. And this kind of tied this transfer station all together with the proposed development. Um, the open space, as you can see, the crosshatch area in here is uh, our mapped wetland area. The area in this orange area is an RP1 wetland. The areas outside of that, and it's um, kind of delineated by the green and the blue edging, are the RP2 areas. Uh, those areas cover uh, a substantial amount of the site. And basically, of the 110 acres, if, and it's kind of difficult how you define the boundaries in between the individual uses, uses 
uh, but that covers the open space covers about 89 acres or about 79 percent of the site. Uh, the recreational facilities, and I'll go over to this this site. Um, the existing driveway here to the uh, the old farmhouse, we're going to maintain that entryway. Uh, we're going to have a paved uh, access drive into a 65 lot parking lot. Uh, there will also be a 20 lot parking lot near the Spurwink Avenue area. This will be for users of the town farm property. So the people who want to use the town farm property don't have to park over there. They'll be able to come in here and park and do uh, dog, washing, uh, dog walking or bird watching or whatever they'd like to do over there. Um, the two fields are anticipated to be multi-purpose fields. They're both 220 feet wide. The upper field is 330 feet long, which will accommodate soccer. Uh, we also anticipate it could be used for lacrosse um, and field hockey. The lower field is 30 feet longer, which will allow it to be uh, used for a football field and still have those other uses that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we're going to have a, a, a um, crushed rock access ways to those sites. That will make the ADA requirements and allow uh, handicapped accessibility <coughs> to the sites. Uh, these will be built on tiers. This field will be approximately five feet higher than this field, so you'll get a terraced effect uh, as you come across the fields. We do have a storage building proposed. That is going to be almost identical to the storage building, which is at the swap shop off on the transfer station. Uh, there will be portable uh, toilet facilities provided. And we also have this dark and greened area, which represents a grass surface overflow area. And that will have a gravel base with grass over it, so in case the, the parking lot uh, needs more capacity, we'll be able to provide that. The recreational facility, uh, uh, excuse me, um, the size of that, excuse me, is 16 and a half acres, and that covers roughly 15% of the site. Of that 16 and a half acres, a little over nine acres will be disturbed by this, and we'll be creating about 1.3 acres of new impervious area. The public works facility, the access to that facility will be off uh, what's called Denison Drive. Um, if you allow me to go back to the recreational area, we're calling this Access Drive, Gull Crest Drive, just for the purposes of being able to, to identify these, these roadways. The access will be off of Denison Drive. We'll be creating a new drive right by the existing salt shed. We push it up a little bit, and we're going to have to relocate some tanks that are there now with some calcium chloride tanks. Uh, we'll have a paved drive coming into the Public Works facility. The new Public Works facility is approximately uh, 19,700 square feet in size. There'll be visitor parking along the front. There'll be uh, management parking along this side and then employee parking uh, in this area. We are proposing a fuel storage, uh, fuel station area. There'll be two underground tanks, one 10,000 gallon tank and, uh, for diesel and another 10,000 gallon tank for unleaded fuel. Uh, this area in here will be paved. There's a gravel surface area behind that. That's intended for the storage of equipment and materials and gravels and pipes and those kinds of things. Uh, that whole area will be encompassed by a chain link fence. It's a six foot high fence. Uh, there will also be an access drive back here on the back side of the, of the facility which will tie in with a transfer station. We think that will be used just for the Public Works employees and will allow them to, to go back and forth uh, and help their operation and tie the two facilities together. Um, there are also going to be some gates. There's an existing gate here now. We're proposing to relocate that. This is over on the recreational side, uh, down so that you'll still be able to access this parking lot if you want to go take an early morning walk, but you won't be able to go back down in, into this area during areas that, uh, that it's not in use. There'll be a new gate. There's an existing gate up here by the transfer station entrance. We'll be taking that down, putting a new gate on the upper road and on the lower road. And there'll also be gates around the facility in the entrance area here, here, and back here. Um, for utilities, we're providing a, a sanitary sewer line from the public works facility that will go to a pump station in this location. That, from that pump station, the, the sewage would be pumped uphill to Spurwink Avenue and then downhill to the treatment plant on the other side of Spurwink, excuse me, the pump station on the other side of Spurwink Avenue and then it will be pumped to the treatment station. 
treatment plant across the street. Uh, we're providing water. There's an existing water line that cuts behind the salt shed. We're going to tie into that line and provide uh, sprinkler service and domestic water for that. We'll have electric and cable TV and, and telephone and telecommunications um, provided. There'll also be lighting along the entranceway here and around the building itself. Uh, those will, that'll be cut down style lighting so that it won't be shining across the property lines. Uh, it's fairly, sim fairly similar to the shoebox style lighting except it has a more rounded top. Uh, we'll also be providing landscaping. As you can see on this plan, the, the green circles are the more landscaping areas. And there'll be directional signs, uh, entrance signs here and here, and some directional signs in the transfer station facility itself. Um, the public works facility basically covers about 7.2 uh, acres, which is about 6.5% of the site. Uh, we'll be disturbing about 5.4 acres of that, that general area and creating a, about 3.75 acres of impervious area, so we'll be creating a little bit over five acres of um, impervious area. The stormwater, what we're proposing to do is sheet flow most of the water off the site and into this vast wetland areas and these use the natural detention capabilities of those areas and those and the buffering areas to, uh, to detain the runoff and to treat the runoff before it gets into the, the ocean. Um, I think that's a general overview. I will also point out this is a rendering of the public works facility. It's taken from this angle here, and that this corner here represents that corner. Uh, it's uh, basically a, a brick and, and concrete structure. We've got a few architectural features over the doorway, which will also act as uh, sun protection and winter and weather protection. Uh, the existing office area, which will be located in this quadrant of the building, is pretty much a duplicate of what exists now. We have um, a mechanics bay area in this side of the building. There'll be a wash down area over here for vehicles uh, for the municipal use. And then an equipment storage area in the back. And this is intended to be a drive through so that you'll be able to come in here, enter the building here, and then drive straight through and go out. Um, that's pretty much a, a synopsis of what, what we have proposed <coughs> um, to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Once again, the board members, we have to deal with completeness first. Any questions or concerns? Mark. I have a question for, for Steve, and I was just wondering, uh, how have you approached uh, traffic generation by this facility? Have you done any uh, work that would lead you to believe what the sort of uses of the combined fields and, and building would end up being? Mm -hmm. Yes, we have. Um, we had uh, Bill Eaton of Eaton Traffic Engineering, who's a, a traffic consultant, take a look at this. It's uh, As part of our permitting for this project, we'll get, we're going to need a uh, DEP approval from the state uh, environmental folks. And one of the things they were interested in the conversation was uh, the traffic impact for this. Um, we had Bill look at it. He went down to the public works facility that exists across the street and did a traffic count there. He's also tried to look in the data to find uh, some recreational use data. And that, that data is fairly hard to come by. So uh, we've kind of used a, a more of a common sense approach to, to sizing these things. He's looked at the intersection up here in the site distance, and I believe it's, it's in excess of 500 feet in both directions. And that would easily meet the requirements that are in the ordinance, but I also wanted him to look at it from a, an MDOT's perspective where we did need to get the DEP's approval on this. And it, for a high volume intersection, which this would be with the traffic that could be generated through here, that's adequate site distance. Uh, basically what Bill found though in, in regards to the traffic from the public works facility due to their hours, they're going to basically be displacing the traffic that used to be coming down the town center and bringing it over here. But they tend to start earlier than the, the uh, peak hour traffic on Spurwink Avenue, and they, they tend to leave a little bit earlier, too. And he didn't feel that that would be an impact to the Spurwink Avenue um, traffic volume. Uh, the recreational field, again, we thought that was going to be used later in the afternoon. Um, it would, uh, ho hopefully the, the events here would 
probably be staggered. They wouldn't have one game starting at the same time. Uh, and he also has uh, gone through the traffic generation of that. And that's, uh, I have the letter um, dated July 9th, and I was hoping to submit that in the next package so that you folks could, could have a look at it. Thank you. <clears throat> Nancy. Um, <clears throat> I should know the answer to this, but I don't. Um, how many trucks is that building going to accommodate? Are you going to park them outside or inside or... Let me take. I know you have some dump let, trucks. Let me in. let me pass that on to to Bob Malley and just get a better idea of his inventory. It's our plan to store all the vehicles inside. We store vehicles down at Fort Williams, and we have vehicles out back here at Town Hall. But uh, we're not planning on storing any vehicles outside. There might be snow plows outside, but uh, all the vehicles will be inside the building. Can you do that now? Yes, we can. Okay, thanks. Oh, you didn't. You didn't tell me how many oh, okay. Okay. that we have. Well, we have a number of pieces of equipment, I and mean, we are we're probably over forty pieces of equipment, and, and that's a combination of dump trucks, front-end loaders. Uh, lawn mowers, pickups, uh, light vehicles like that. So uh, probably inside the building, anywhere from 12 to 13 to 14. But again, we do store vehicles at Fort Williams, and we're going to continue to do that. So they're not all under one roof. Okay, thanks. Yep. Mr. Chair? Mark. Uh, I have a question for who, uh, whomever uh, can probably deal with this best is, um, in terms of the day-to-day -day operation, this is sort of a mixed-use facility. Uh, is it maintained and operated by different departments within the town and in terms of uh, sort of ongoing planning for events and maintenance and mowing and landscaping? Just this is a sort of whole property management aspect of this. Is this sort of by a, a Gulf, somebody responsible for the Gullcrest? area or is it different town departments? How will it actually work? Let me try to answer this, Bob, and if I <coughs> speak incorrectly, you can come up and correct me immediately. Um, the way I understand it will work, basically what, one of the things I, I didn't really emphasize in my presentation was the transfer stations here. And the whole intent was to try to tie the transfer station and the public works department facility together and have it kind of work as more of one operation. Right now the public works uh, department maintains and takes care of the transfer station and they'll also be taking care of their own building. Uh, we do have uh, some oak groves, and oak and chestnut groves through here that we're going to try to maintain and then supplement that with some more planning so that that becomes more of one complex and the recreational area becomes kind of separated from that so that if you're over here watching a ball game you don't feel like you're in an industrial park. But it's also my understanding that the Public Works will be maintaining those fields and uh, this parking lot and, and the building as they do with all the other fields in town. Thanks. Also, Mark, if it works as other playing fields do, most of the scheduling for the playing field is handled by community services. And that's just for the scheduling. No further discussion? Someone like to make a motion in regards to completeness or incompleteness? <clears throat> Are we going to go through the completeness check? We can if you like. There are some P's there, which I think means partial. Would you like me to do that? Go right ahead, Maureen. Well, starting at the top of page two of the memo you received from me, <clears throat> uh, starting with item 10. Uh, Typically, when you have a parking lot designed, you have a parking lot uh, dimension, a parking space dimension, and a parking lot dimension. Uh, Mr. Harding has called me and informed me that sheet C-104 actually has that dimensioned out, so I missed that, and there is some information regarding that. Under 12C, uh, typically you receive a letter from the water district asserting there's adequate water supply. My understanding is that the applicant has that and will submit it in the next package to the board. Uh, under item 13, uh, there are significant stands of vegetation, such as the oak groves that Mr. Harding has mentioned, and there is not in this at this time a preservation plan 
for preserving those during the construction phase. My understanding is the applicant uh, is happy to provide that in the next submission. Uh, under item 14, the lighting plan, typically you get some information about foot candle illumination. Uh, there is some information in the package. Uh, usually the board's concern is that there is not a significant amount of light spillage onto abutting properties. And due to the size of the site, there's no expectation that the lighting that's proposed will reach the property line. Uh, and under fi 15, uh, the applicant is proposing <coughs> some new signs. And the signs and the locations have been identified, but we haven't provided any information about the dimension and the type of material. Uh, my understanding is the applicant is more than willing to provide that with the next submission. And under item 11, under the resource protection permit, uh, typically when uh, there is going to be some alteration of wetlands, the board has in the past asked for total square footage or cubic yards of uh, fill that are going to be placed in wetland areas. That hasn't been provided, but the applicant uh, easily can calculate it and is willing to put that in the next application package. Are there any questions? <clears throat> any questions of the planner from the board? Steve. I'd like to make a motion. Motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the Town of Cape Elizabeth for site plan review, resource protection permit, and conditional use re review of the Gulf Crest Facilities Plan located at 478 Spurwink Avenue be deemed complete. Be it further. Can we do one other time? Yep. All, all time. Okay. And be it further ordered that the above plan be tabled to the regular August 17th, 1999 meeting of the Planning Board, at which time a public hearing shall be held. Second. Any discussion of the motion proposed? Hearing none, all those in favor, please. Opposed? Carries unanimously. This time I'd like to poll the Board as in regards to holding a site walk. Uh, it probably would be in the best public interest if we could hold the site walk before the public hearing, and then the public could address their concerns to us. Nancy? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Any comments concerning a site walk? <clears throat> My feelings are because it will involve tax dollars and possibly even a bond issue that we should schedule it and advertise it heavily, and hopefully the public will show up. When? I would suggest, if our schedule is allowed, to do it before the public hearing so that those people who attend, if they have any concerns, they can address them at the public hearing. We have it in August. Calendar. We're going to try to do this. Uh, we have plenty of light during the week as well. So do it after work. It's what you've proposed in the past, Steve. It seems to work out and gets good attendance from board members. What, Saturday morning? Yeah, all Saturday morning. Just if there's a consensus you want to hold a public uh, uh, a site walk. Uh, I was out there uh, just walking the trails, and I was out there for a good hour and a half. So <clears> it, you, you may want to think more in terms of Saturday morning than and after in the after, in the on the week. Okay, then another question then. I mean, can you really see anything or the trails so densely foliated on each side that you really can't see anything. There's, uh, the, when I was out there, the, the location of the public works building and the fields were very clearly staked out. So, um, yes, you, <coughs> in my opinion, you'll get to see a lot. A lot of it's open field. Okay, then I guess as early in the day as possible. Does everybody have an open sad day coming up soon? Mm -hmm. Best way to do this is what sad days are not open, pulling the board members here today. <clears throat> what are the dates of the Saturdays coming? Well, this coming Saturday is the 24th. Then there's July 31st, August 7th. August 7th is the Beach to Beacon race. That would be bad. August 14th. Yeah. That would still make it before the next meeting, correct? That's fine. August 14th? I won't be there, but that's okay. Is there okay. a problem with next Saturday, or is it too soon? <clears throat> it's just that we wouldn't be able to advertise it well okay. using the Cape Courier. July 31st. Oh, July 31st? Fine. July 31st would be okay with me. I think it's good attendance. Let's try for the 31st. 31st? No, no. July, July 31st. 31st. Probably 
and it's going to be tough to get everyone there on a Saturday. I'm, I'm sure it's it is. Eight going to of them be tough. in the summertime. <clears throat> Let's try for the 31st. That'll still give us time to advertise in the courier. Is 8 o'clock too early? Good. Hey, it's fine. 8 o'clock. And um, we meet at the entrance. What is it, Cooper Drive now? Uh, uh, we could all park at the salt yeah. shed and walk up from there. Yeah, yeah that's right. parking. Right mm. the best mm. spot. You might even want to mention that, Maureen, in case the public shows up with 20 vehicles. They can all park there as well. So where are we parking? At the salt shed. The very large shed you pass on the way to the transfer station. Mm -hmm. I assume there will be a memo going out. <clears throat> Any comments from the board before we move on to the next agenda item? Any questions on behalf of the applicant? No, thank you very much. Thank you. Next item on the agenda, Monaghan Resource Protection Permit, request by Stephen Monaghan for a resource protection permit to construct a driveway in a wetland for access to a lot located at 14 Eastfield Road, Section 19-8-3, Resource Protection Permit Completeness. <clears throat> Took half my introduction. Um, there's an existing home on Eastfield Road. I initiated construction uh, with a contractor over 19 months ago, he unfortunately has miserably failed financially. So I'm taking this project on myself to complete it. Consequently, the home has been a considerable eyesore for the last probably 12 months, unfinished, you know, in the wind, pretty much. Uh, it was originally permitted to have the driveway and utility run go around the abutting lot, lot number 12. And I've depicted that. Well, I've given you a map to depict that lot as well as the proposed driveway run that I'm recommending and asking for my resource protection permit. <laughs> the, uh, the rationale is to, one, help me because I'm a little bit financially drained. Two, the existing structure of the home has a garage facing the street consistent with other homes in the neighborhood, so it would be more consistent if it had a driveway going across my property to the, to the access road, Eastfield Road. And because of the length of the original permitted pipe run, which I've paced out to be about 450 feet, it probably would require a pumping station because of elevation requirements. And that, I was told, would probably be more problematic and probably more of a threat to the resource area, protection area, than just having, you know, me dig and bury a pipe. So what I've done is, I've, under uh, Maureen's advice, I've hired a uh, soils engineer, uh, Albert. He's delineated what is now considered the, the RP2 protected area, and I've uh, designed a driveway to minimize impact by making it narrow as it crosses that small area, which represents about uh, 26 by 57, and, uh, and then have, as I dig the driveway, have the pipe run go with the driveway and then back over to where the utility hookups are in front of the property. Um, again, in doing this, it, it alleviates some costs for me. It's a more direct run, less problematic with my utilities, which will be sewer and, uh, and the in, in public water. And then it also alleviates me having to have a shared driveway on lot 12 with the new owner who's now building a house. And I won't have to worry about you know, responsibilities associated with that. And also, it, it may even... Uh, alleviate some water drainage problems as water comes off the back hill. I can, I'm going to have a culvert under my driveway so we can direct the water from the back of his lot, which has been going on to another neighbor's lot, into the lowland of my lot. It should, you know, should save some pro problems there. Thank you, Maureen. Any comments on this application? No. What you 
it's really up to the board tonight how far you want to go with this application. Uh, the first thing, the first action you should take should be determine completeness. Um, and, or, of course, if you determine that it's incomplete, you don't need to do anything else except identify the information needed to make it complete. <clears throat> if you do determine that it's complete, uh, you can then begin to act on the application. Uh, the ordinance provides you the option, but not the requirement, to hold a site walk or to hold a public hearing. If you choose not to hold a public hearing, you can consider some motion for approval this evening. So it's really at your discretion. In regards to completeness, any comments from the board? <clears throat> Should we go through that list? Go through the list. One. From Maureen, question. you want to carry through us? Yes, Nancy, go right ahead. I'm a little confused by this um, presentation. Uh, is this is this all one lot? Lot 14 and lot 28 were combined into one parcel in, in your map. Okay. Lot 12 is a separate uh, lot. It belongs to a, another party, Steve Riccio. Okay? So my lot, my land, is lot 14 and lot 28 combined. And they call it lot 14. Okay. Maureen, would you like but to nobody's on, on lot 28. Yep. Correct. Right. Lot 28 is not buildable because that's considered yeah, it's all wetland. wetland. Right. But they are combined. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Lot 29 for your edification is owned by the city. Uh, to go through the completeness checklist, we're using the completeness checklist under the resource protection permits. Under item 2, uh, the, the uh, Resource protection permit requires uh, information about proposed and existing grades at 1-4 contours. Uh, some grades are proposed, but proposed grades, uh, most of the proposed grades are not included. Uh, however, the applicant has tried to provide a cross-section, and the uh, town engineer reviewing this application uh, would support the request for a waiver of providing those <coughs> proposed grades because of a small area that's involved with the driveway. Under item 3, uh, the applicant has not provided a written description of the parcel. However, he, he has provided a map with the survey and meets and bounds description showing the parcel. Um, under five, uh, typically the board uses information regarding soils and vegetation to identify the boundaries of wetlands. In the past, when you have received uh, thorough or adequate information about soils, you've been willing to waive information regarding wetlands in order to, uh, excuse me, vegetation to determine the wetland boundary. The applicant has provided some vegetation information, but overall has requested a waiver of uh, required, required information regarding vegetation because the soils information has been provided and that's been used to identify the wetland boundary. Um, However, under item 6, uh, while a professional soil scientist has been used to identify the soils, a high-intensity soil survey has not been prepared and a waiver is being requested for that information. And finally, uh, the applicant has requested a waiver from providing information regarding water flows. Uh, there is not a lot of specific information about that, but the applicant has provided some, some general information about how water flows across the site. Any questions? <clears throat> Any questions from the board to the town planner or the applicant in regards to completeness? Mr. Parkhurst? I'd like to make a motion. A uh, motion for the board to consider. Uh, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Stephen, I know I'm going to not do a good job with this. I'm sorry, and I assume Mrs. Monaghan for a resource protection permit to construct a driveway over an RP2 wetland on their lot located at 14 Eastfield Road be deemed complete. Second. Thank you, Tom. Further discussion from the board? We have a motion and a second before us on completeness. I'll call for a vote. All those in favor, please signify by your right hand. It is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. We're not finished yet. 
<laughs> no, you're only complete. <laughs> yeah. um, I've got a question for the town planner. Has, has there been any issues from any neighbors or anything like that regarding what's going on with this lot? Uh, I haven't received any calls or questions about, about the lot. We have mailed out a notice for this meeting tonight. There's also been a notice mailed for the previous workshop. And this, this item was on a workshop agenda. Um, my understanding is that the applicant has discussed this with his neighbor and, and has also discussed it with some of the other neighbors in the area. Uh, but I haven't received any calls or questions. So would it be fair to ask tonight if there's anyone here that might be interested in having a public hearing that's a member of the audience? It's not... No, no, I can do there's, that. There's no one here. <laughs> okay. I don't know who the people are in the audience. There's been nothing requested through your offices? Okay. So I guess based on that, it doesn't seem to me to be necessary for a public hearing to be held. That's my Is the board in agreement? Doesn't seem to be any great public outcry. I agree. Okay. That takes care of the public hearing. How about the sidewalk? What a what? A sidewalk? Oh. I'm not if in needed. I'm not interested. I'm, I'm, I've been by the house before, so. Mr. Wilcox lives in the neighborhood, so we'll, we'll go on his good judgment. I'm already familiar with the, with the land there. Very well, so there will not be a site mark, and there will not be a public hearing. I think if things have been worked out between the two neighbors, that's the important thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure the neighborhood would like to see this house completed. Yep. We can at this time, if the board agrees, move on to the resource protection permit. Mm -hmm. Maureen, would you want to go through the checklist with us? Certainly. Uh, again, as requested, uh, what I've done for this evening in the memo in front of you is gone through the different uh, standards of review for resource protection permit. Uh, I don't know if there's any specific questions on any of these standards. The only one um, I would call attention to would be a number 10, uh, which is erosion control. Uh, the ordinance specifically requires that uh, in order to control erosion on the site, that construction be uh, done in accordance with the provisions of the Environmental Quality Erosion and Sediment Control Handbook. I'm suggesting that the board may want to condition a, the approval of this uh, project on construction at the site being done in accordance with this handbook. What that would mean is whatever this handbook requires in terms of silt fencing or hay bales or, or whatever to prevent erosion into the wetland would, would be required as part of this approval. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions? I have a question. Tom? Uh, Nothing's ever as uh, simple as it may appear, and I'm not talking specifically about this application. I got a very unusual phone call at the office from an attorney last week on the most bizarre situation that one would never, ever guess would bring two neighbors to uh, litigation. Uh, and that has nothing to do with the application before us. But uh, I just want to take a, a moment and uh, understand how we got to this point in terms — and uh, this is for the public record since this is a public meeting this evening — and specifically what I'm getting at is, has someone come to the town, gotten approval from either a planning board or a code enforcement officer to develop a lot in a certain way and done it so poorly that now that the person who currently owns the lot has had to come back to the town and circumvent the original intention and concerns of the original approval? Uh, was there a specific reason why this driveway was to take this circuitous route to this house lot other than to the obvious one to miss the wetlands? Go right ahead, Maureen. In, in uh, my review of, of the building permit file, it appears that um, I, I think most of the board members are aware that the town was involved in a lawsuit in this part of town regarding development of lots that are in wetland areas. There was a settlement. Um, when the original building permit was applied for for these lots, I believe it was assumed that these lots were part of the settlement. Because it was assumed that it was part of the settlement, there was a condition imposed by the code enforcement officer at that time that the driveway access to this lot would have to come off of the other lot. Uh, when Mr. Monaghan came, came before us uh, and spoke to the current code officer, the research was done and we determined that these lots, in fact, were not part of the original lawsuit. There was nothing that was requiring that uh, 
there's nothing that says that you couldn't go to the planning board and ask for a permit to alter this wetland. So uh, the, the applicant, Mr. Monahan, chose to come to the board tonight and see if he could get the driveway relocated. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so I'll get to the uh, specific issues. Um, did you prepare? I, I see, um, again, we have a plan in front of us that uh, if it were, it, it's just fraught with potential legal issues from the standpoint of who's prepared what information and what information is lying on top of who else's information, for lack of the proper term. What I mean by that, for example, if one hires a professional surveyor to go out and do a boundary survey, and then starts doing work on top of that that isn't representing or tracing that map and not uh, retracing the information correctly and accurately, and then referencing the original boundary survey, then there's potential for issues to arise. But the plan that I have in front of me has Albert Frick's name on it with a reference to a pre-construction topographic information from uh, the subdivision approval. So I understand if one had to go find that information, that's, that's referenced. And then there's uh, some freehand information, for example, the dimensions of the existing building and the proposed driveway layout and the location of the uh, pipes. Is that part of your proposed design, or is that a representation made by the soil scientists um, as to what they think the design is? Who, who actually prepared that information? The handwritten notations on that map, which the map was originally made by Albert Frick, and Maureen has uh, her own copy. It was mailed to her mm -hmm. on its completion. I've made notes on top of that to, to make it easy to work off the same uh, basis for what Albert Frick has done. And then I made a note to uh, revision description. And this is per the advice of uh, Jim Logan, who is the engineer at Albert Frick. He says, if you make changes to the map, just put the revision and the date on the bottom and explain what those changes are, and that upgrades the revision. So as you refer from one map, an older one, to this one, you know, you can, you can make that correlation. But my question is, did you make those changes or did, um, well, let's back up a minute. Are you, are you an engineer or a land use professional? As to, and again, I'm not trying to put you into a corner, and I'm not trying to, trying to embarrass you or to make this more complicated than it needs to be, but... If, if, if we were to approve this on face value and there's information on here that isn't represented by the people who did the original work, then my concern is that, that, that the code enforcement officer may be, we may be, be back in a situation where the next two applicants are in another month or so. Um, I have an engineering degree, but I, I don't have a certificate okay. you know, in land use. Uh, well, I'll leave that up to the code enforcement officer. I, I think there's an issue if someone takes... Um, this is a third generation representation. For example, the, the property lines aren't defined here as a boundary survey, so that um, one can't really say where there are dimensions on here, but there's no meets or bounds. Was, was a boundary survey submitted as part of the application? I originally, in, in, in our workshop session, gave you a copy of a survey that was conducted by my bank that was a certified. Okay. And I'm very happy to make, this, this. to make this a condition. If this gets to an approval vote, I'm very happy to make this a condition. I'm not trying to tie you up this evening. Sure. Uh, clarification. You show the proposed um, culvert uh, going into the adjacent lot. Um, which would imply to me yeah, either you're required to have a construction easement or an easement to use the, the land on the adjacent lot. Um, similarly, there may be grading that's required on the adjacent lot. Is there anything in the package that indicates that your butter has granted you those, those easements? His signature is on this map on the right-hand side. I met with him. I had him review this revision and have him sign there to okay it, and that's what he's done, Steve Riccio. I see. And what I would intend to do is, as I move forward is the old easement, the driveway that used, goes around the back of this lot and then towards the right of it, have that removed and have it replaced with this new one. That would be per Maureen's suggestion. And uh, 15 years ago when I moved to Cape Elizabeth into an existing subdivision, the uh, mortgage survey indicated a two-foot uh, overrun on the property line of the adjacent driveway. Uh, we get along great as neighbors, and I've never pressed the issue. You've, you appear to create something here, and it's very nitpicky, but you're starting from scratch and have an opportunity to do it right at this point. The, 
<clears throat> is the mortgage inspection. The plan that's in front of us that's signed by the butter indicates is the butter also signing off on the uh, driveway going into his uh, into his as, as minute as it is, and I'm only raising this because of the phone call I got. That was the intent from an attorney with his signature. It was my request to okay that, and that's the intent I have him signing that is to okay. Uh, the I'm, I'm going to stipulate as a condition of approval that some more legal evidence be provided to the town that uh, there's a there's. A, Whatever the code enforcement needs, let, let me just interrupt and ask Maureen: is, is that a reasonable request? Is this is this something that the code enforcement officer would be comfortable in terms of having in the file that indicates that there's easement consent to do the work that's depicted on the plan? You're talking about the driveway. Yeah, both the yeah. Dri the driveway at the property corner and the extension of the culvert and yeah. earthwork onto the adjacent property. When when I've, I met with the um, the applicant, I have advised him that I think it's imperative that. Um, he he prepare a new easement for all of the uh, work on the driveway that may potentially overlap onto his neighbor's property. Okay. He said he's willing to do that, but we don't have it in front of us this evening. You could make it a condition of yeah, approval I don't, I don't, that, that that be done. I don't mind doing that at all. Um, and the house is an existing house. The porch is existing, and, and the applicant has represented the uh, slopes of the driveway. So that's... That's all. Nancy. I take it that um, there is no dwelling on the, on Mr. Riccio's, Riccio's right. lot. On lot 12, there isn't. I believe he's going to initiate construction. I know he has permits for use utilities already. In my last conversation with him, it seemed as though he was going to do it in the next month or so. And his access is going to be. It'll be on the corner. The same as yours. I mean, you know, from that end. His access will be where the current driveway is, which I haven't put in your your site map. It's the right-hand corner of Lot 12 and the Eastfield Road. It comes in there and it goes back up his property line, probably about a third way in, and then he's going to turn into his house. So he'll have his own driveway. Okay. Originally, what I would have to do is use that entrance for mine, go up, go up to his lot line, then mm -hmm. take a left-hand turn and go on the sense. back. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> is that a wetland to the right of your driveway coming in off of uh, Carriage Hill Road? Is that a wetland? It's got a little mark. <clears throat> yeah, that is. The, mm -hmm. the, the darkened lines depict the delineation. The little crown-like thing. That's a wetland. Can I walk over and see where you're? Uh, everything within this line is wetland. Yeah. This. This is a wetland. Yes, this is a wetland. Inside. Further comments from the board? Do you have anything further, Maureen? Tom, you wanted to add a condition. Would you like to make the motion? Sure. Thank you. Let me get to the correct page. Motion for the board consider finding of facts. Stephen and Fima uh, Feely. Fima Feely, sorry. Uh, Monaghan? Yes. Are requesting a resource protection permit to construct. We should, at, at each workshop, take the time to uh, learn everybody's name, shouldn't we? <laughs> it appears. Let's yeah. try. Our, our, our <laughs> If it makes you feel better, my last name's Emery, and everybody smells, spells it wrong when I'm here, and when I'm in the South, they spell it wrong. So don't feel bad. Uh, 
are requesting a resource protection permit to construct a driveway over RP2 wetland on their lot located at 14 Eastfield Road. Two, the proximity of the wetland and the driveway construction indicate erosion could occur if best management practices are not used. Three, the application substantially complies with Section 19-8-3 resource protection permit regulations. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Stephen, Mr. and Mrs. Stephen Monaghan for a resource protection permit to construct a driveway over RP2 wetland on their lot located at 14 Eastfield Road be approved with the following conditions. One, that all construction be accomplished in conformance with erosion prevention provisions of the Environmental Quality Erosion and Sedimentation Control Handbook published by the Maine Soil and Water Conservation Service. Two, uh, that uh, proper easement be prepared and submitted to the town planner and code enforcement officer for construction purposes and placement of uh, culverts and driveways on the adjacent lot. And three, that the boundary survey uh, be submitted with uh, the easement. Thank you, Tom. Is there a second? Second. Second, <clears throat> second by Steve Parkhurst. Further discussion from board members? Hearing none, those in favor of the proposal, please raise your right hand. Those opposed? It is unanimous. Thank you. To the applicant, continue to work closely with our code enforcement office and town planner. Certainly will. Thank you. And hopefully we'll get you moved into your home. <laughs> Next item on the agenda, <clears throat> Chance Highland Subdivision Amendment, request by John Chance for an amendment to the previously approved Highland Subdivision to revise the building envelope for Lot 3, located at 6 Cove View Road, Section 16-2-5, amendment to a previously approved subdivision. Thank you, Mr. Cotter. Good evening. The purpose uh, for my application for the amendment to a pre-existing uh, or pre-approved existing subdivision is to expand uh, the present building envelope. And this is based on information obtained through reevaluation of the existing wetlands by Woodlot Alternatives of uh, Topsom. As you can see uh, on the diagrams in front of you, the existing wetlands uh, were, were between my lot, lot three, and lot four, which are the ones really in question. The new wetlands um, evaluation showed RP2 type wetlands in the back uh, northwest corner of the property. And Based on this information, primarily, uh, we reevaluated the entire property and had Owen Haskell reassess the setbacks with a 25-foot setback from the RP2 wetlands. And, and the normal 30-foot uh, setback for uh, front and side as per the covenants of the subdivision. Comments from the town planner? Um, like, like the previous item, the board has some flexibility in how much uh, procedure you want to attach to this. You could you know, make a finding of completeness and, and hold a site walk and schedule a public hearing and treat it just like a full-blown subdivision. Um, it is coming under the amendment to a previously approved subdivision, so you, you can use, you can borrow as many of the subdivision procedures as you would like or feel are appropriate. Uh, alternately, you could look at the amendment this evening, make um, just a consensus opinion that you have sufficient information to determine, uh, to make a decision, and you could actually um, make a motion this evening. Are there any questions? <clears throat> you have one. Why do we have three maps? 
Well, I had advised the applicant that you should have two plans, and, and one of the plans they prepared wasn't what I had originally suggested, so they made another attempt at it. Uh, my recommendation was to provide you with two plans. One plan would show both the existing building envelope and the proposed building envelope, so you could see what the magnitude of change is that you're being asked to make. The second plan would just show the proposed building envelope and would be a representation of the recording plat that you would be asked to sign if you approve this request. Right. So what you have is uh, something that looks like a recording plat because it has a signature block, but in fact it's just the plan that shows existing and proposed. And then you have a second plan that doesn't look like a recording plat because there's no signature block, but the reason it doesn't look like a recording plat is that they've only photocopied a portion of it, and I actually have the whole plan tonight, and, and he has the whole plan up in there, and it, and it does have a signature block, and it could be signed this evening. <coughs> so um, the other reason you have a second plan is that uh, we, the, the applicant made a couple of attempts to uh, more uh, specifically identify the location of the building envelope in relation to the property line so that there would not be confusion in the future about where the building envelope is located when you have different surveyors go out there. <coughs> Further comments from the board? Mr. Parkers. I can make a motion. Motion for the board to consider findings of fact. Number one, John Chance is requesting an amendment to the previously approved Highland subdivision to revise the building envelope for lot three located at 6 Code View Road. Number two, the revised building envelope will maintain a 25 foot setback from wetland boundaries and a 30 foot property line setback. Number three, the application substantially complies with section 16 2 5, amendment to a previously approved subdivision. Therefore, be it ordered that, based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of John Chance for an amendment to a previously approved Highland subdivision lot to revise the building envelope for lot three, located at 6 Coview Road, be approved. Motion has been made. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mark. Motion and a second has been made. Is there further discussion of the motion? Mr. Emery. I have a couple of questions. We know about my disclosure. I don't think I have to bring that up again this evening. So, uh, to the town planner, uh, we have a—I have a plan that's stamped July 2nd, and then I have a plan that is dated July 16th. Is it the July 16th plan that we're voting on, or is it the enlargement? It's the enlargement, but it's an enlargement with triangulation. <coughs> it's a what? concern was that it's the enlargement with some additional information that shows where the building envelope is located. So what's happened, and I can, I can show the board, is that there are some measurements on the upper corners of the lot that tie the building envelope to the property line, and it tells you from a corner. For example, on the... That's this plan here, is it not? Right. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's big. In Actually, the, in the legend it's is a different. Well, it's a combination of the two because the, the plan you have shows an existing building mm -hmm. envelope line, which is not the plan you're being asked to approve tonight. You're being asked to approve a plan that only has the proposed building envelope line. Okay. The house is existing? Yes. Just for clarification for all of us sitting here this evening and watching TV and enjoying this, and I'm sure the applicant is. Um, and I guess if I owned a, a new lot in Cape Elizabeth, I'd have the same question. Uh, wetlands fluctuate by season, well, by regulation, if nothing else, and by biologists. Um, if the applicant were to do a long-term mass plan of this property, and um, how, is, how is that uh, wetland buffer treated or that wetland setback treated? What is the life uh, usefulness of that setback line? Is that a question to me? Yes. Um, I actually have had a couple of conversations with the surveyor on this project, and, and the plan, there, there was a plan that actually showed the building envelope being set back 25 feet from the setback line, and I asked her to remove that information from, from the uh, plan for exactly that reason, that 
built that brought wetland boundaries can fluctuate. So the building envelope that's shown to you tonight is set back from the wetland that exists tonight. But the applicant is at risk for any changes in wetland regulations, either from the town side, state, state, or federal. The, I mean that the determining factor on the, on that corner of the parcel, and this probably applies to the next one too, is, is the issue of, of the wetland line, its, its delineation, and its regulatory. That that is always in a state of flux, regardless of what these recording plat, plats show. <clears throat> I think the question you're asking is a question of vested interest. And, um, you know, if, if there's a regulation that passed tomorrow that says RP2 wetlands, that there has to be a 100-foot setback, and it applies to all lots, regardless of whether or not they have a building envelope, then this, this lot would obviously be impacted. The house, the house would be fine, but if he had a pool house or something in the back corner that uh, had not been constructed, then that could conceivably be out of luck. No two-year implied warranty on the... Uh, it, well, just to give you an example, when the town adopted... Another case that's come up recently, by the way. Uh, when the council adopted the, the wetlands regulations that we've lived with for the past nine years, uh, they passed a... Uh, they gave a, a grandfathering period of 10 years. So any lot that's out there that received approval after 1976 is part of a subdivision that received some kind of wetlands review had a window of opportunity of 10 years. And that window closes next May 10th, year 2000. Okay. Thank you. Further questions or comments from the board? Hearing none, those in favor of the motion, please signify by raising your right hand. It is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you to the applicant. Thank you. Again, as I've told everyone, work closely with your code enforcement officer and the town planner, <laughs> and you won't have to come back. <laughs> Last item on the agenda this evening is Man Call Highland Subdivision Amendment, request by David Rogers representing Andrew and Denise Man Call for an amendment to the previously approved Highland Subdivision to revise the building envelope for Lot 10, 5 Coalview Road, Section 16-2-5, amendment to a previously approved subdivision. Maureen, would you like to introduce this for us? Uh, this is very similar to the previous item. The applicant uh, actually laid out the building envelope, received a building permit to start construction, uh, was in the process of construction the lot, constructing uh, the, the house and attached garage. A mortgage survey was then done, and the mortgage surveyor found that the garage actually extended outside the building envelope by approximately five feet. Uh, the code enforcement officer suspended construction on the garage, and the applicant has approached the planning board to revise the building envelope, essentially reducing the setback from the wetland by, I believe, five feet to allow the house to continue to be constructed. Uh, like the previous application, the applicant did go out and survey the wetland edge based on the current wetland regulations. <clears throat> the applicant have anything further to add? Not too much. Uh, <clears throat> very somewhat of the previous case. Um, the only difference possibly was that this house was, um, was already built or in the process of being built when, when the mortgage inspection was done and the problem was, was identified. But uh, I think the, the, the main problem here was the identification of the location of the wetland originally. Uh, I've worked on a number of wetland location projects, and typically what happens in subdivisions where there's a significant amount of wetland is the, uh, the major portion of the wetland will be accurately mapped. But quite often there may be a very narrow sliver of, of wetland that protrudes away from the main wetland, and this is probably what this is. It's a very narrow wetland that extends across the back of this lot and that may have not been as accurately located as the main part of the wetland. Typically that's located by uh, maybe a, a tape and compass or something for a, for a short distance and I'm guessing that's may what, what, what happened on this particular lot. So. 
questions and comments from board members? <coughs> Steve? One quick comment. It seems the town maybe should notify everyone else in this subdivision that they may want to check things in case they ever need to finance their house or um, do anything else with their land. This is what, the fifth or sixth one we've had? It's been a long process in doing all the housekeeping chores concerning the Highland subdivision. You're correct, Steve, and your comment is very worthy. Questions from the board? I have a question. Tom? Uh, the previous applicant had uh, the wetland delineated by Woodlot Alternatives, uh, with whom I'm very familiar. Uh, this states that it, the, the wetland was delineated by Livings Livingston Hughes. Um, is, do they have a wetland uh, biologist or soils? Is that you? That's right, yes. And I'm sorry, I didn't get your name? Uh, Leon Blood. Okay, thank you. Uh, in addition to, um, has the setback been changed from 25 feet to 20 feet? Did I hear that correct, Lee Maureen? I believe that's what the setback, yes. Um, this is, both, both of the previous applicants, this applicant, the previous applicant, asked questions, what was the setback approved in the subdivision from wetlands? And there's nothing in the record that shows what was the exact setback. Um, that's why what we did is we, we told them to map the wetland based on the current information and let the board decide what kind of setback you want to establish because you have that flexibility with RP2 wetlands. So in this case, I believe the intent was to create a 25-foot setback um, they slipped outside of, well, depending on who you talk to, they slipped outside the building envelope. The revised building envelope that's proposed before you tonight would maintain a 20-foot setback from the current mapped wetland edge. Um, we're certainly not talking about a variance here, but I'm just wondering about the uh, general, um, again, I'm not trying to be contentious. I just want to be sure we talk this through. The issue of, of a subdivision being approved with an understanding perhaps by abutters and by planning board members that regardless of where the wetland line is, that the minimum buffer would be 25 feet. And we're, we're actually doing two things here. We're redefining that wetland edge, which is very, I understand very clearly, but I'm a little fuzzy on the issue of adjusting the buffer from, or the setback from 25 feet to 20 feet at the same time. Uh there's no uh, specific buffer from an RP2 wetland, unlike an RP1 wetland where you have a 100 to 250 foot buffer. Uh, what the board has done in the past is that you have shown flexibility <coughs> in the width of an RP2 buffer based on what the site can carry and what the applicant's proposing to do with it. So there are sites where you've had a 100 foot buffer for RP2 wetlands. There are sites where your buffer's gone down to 10 feet. And you don't see anything complicating the issue that a previous board approved a 25-foot buffer and now this board is being asked to reduce it to 20? No, because I, I can't find any evidence that the previous board did approve a 25-foot buffer. The, 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 the wetland mapping for this subdivision is um, um, vague, and there's no dimensions on the plans. Uh, some of the wetlands are in the places where they're supposed to be uh, I haven't been able to find a, a soils map so that I can map out uh, what the wetland boundaries would be under today's soils requirements. Uh, so if I could tell you that the intent of the planning board at that time was to maintain a minimum buffer for all lots, um, I would tell you that. But I haven't been able to find any information to that. And the DEP requires zero setback for a wetland of this type? They don't recognize these type of wetlands. Yeah. That's okay. correct. Fine. Thank you. Steve? I'd like to make a motion. Go right ahead. Motion for the board to consider findings of fact. Number one, Andrew and Denise Van Call are requesting an amendment to the previously approved Highland subdivision to revise the building envelope for lot 10, located at 5 Coview Road. Number two, the revised building envelope will maintain a 20 foot setback from the wetland boundaries. Number three, the application substantially complies with section 16 2 5. Amendment to a previously approved subdivision. Therefore, be it ordered that, based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Andrew and Denise Mancall for an amendment to the previously approved Highland subdivision and to revise the building envelope for lot 10, located at 5 Coview Road, be approved. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Masterton. 
Is there further discussion amongst board members? Hearing none, those in favor of the motion, please signify by raising your right hand. It is unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you to the applicant. There's nothing further to come before the board. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. And a second? Second. All those in favor? Thank you very much.